All right, so let's examine uh, Mark chapters 9 through 12 with, uh, again, examining our three major themes of who is Jesus, what is the kingdom of God, and what does discipleship entail. In this first talk, we're going to examine the theme of who is Jesus? And one of the most important things that Jesus begins to explain in Mark 9 through 12 is that he is there to lead us to eternal life. And his purpose in leading us to eternal life is made abundantly clear in the transfiguration, which is uh, at the start of chapter 9 in the Gospel of Mark. So in the transfiguration, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. So mountains are important places of an encounter with God in the gospel of Mark. For example, in Mark chapter three, Jesus goes to a mountain to appoint the 12 apostles. And that appointment of the 12 apostles is the beginning of the new covenant because the 12 apostles in effect represent the same role as the 12 patriarchs for the old covenant. A second occasion is in chapter 6 verse 46 where Jesus goes up to a mountain alone in order to pray and the significance of the mountain there is it's a suitable place for prayer. It's representing both closeness to God and um, a, a place of sacredness uh, as well. And so then that leads us to the transfiguration where we again have an encounter with God. And much of the significance of the mountaintop here is that it echoes the role of the mountaintop in the encounters with God that Moses had in the book of Exodus. So looking at some of the details, we see that Jesus was transfigured before them and his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. So this is reminiscent to some degree of Moses encountering God on Mount Sinai. So for instance, if we look at Exodus chapter 34, Verse 29, it reads, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the covenant in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. So this is the effect that Mark is evoking with his language about the transfiguration. They are in the very presence of God, just as Moses was. And to really bring this, Elijah and Moses then actually appear. Now, Elijah and Moses both had uh, a special uh, relationship with God after their departure from earth. Moses, uh, after he died, he was buried uh, by God in a hidden place where no one could find him. So now at the transfiguration, Moses is again revealed. Elijah departed in a different way. Let's go ahead and review that. That's in the second book of Kings, uh, verse chapter 2, verse 10, or verse 11, sorry. And as Elijah and Elisha went on and talked, behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. So Elijah departed entered the presence of God, and now he's back. This echoes as well what uh, Mark observes about Jesus' dispute with the Sadducees towards the end of chapter 12. God is God of the living, not the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are alive with him. 
And they are seeing Moses and Elijah alive with him here at the moment of the transfiguration. They aren't entirely sure what to make of this. Um, Peter suggests uh, setting up some shelters for them so that they can hang out there indefinitely. But when he makes that suggestion, he does it in part because he's afraid. He doesn't even know what to make of this event. But the event is temporary because a cloud then overshadows them. The cloud conceals the light that they had been experiencing. A voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. So, of course, listen to my beloved son. It's going to be interesting to pay attention to how they did afterward in regard to that. But the transfiguration was a key experience in their lives. They didn't really understand it. Um, when, As they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, so they at least listened to that part, questioning what rising from the dead meant. They, they were, really weren't entirely sure. But nevertheless, the moment was a tremendous consolation on their spiritual journey. And a major theme we see throughout the Gospel of Mark is the idea of a cycle of consolation and desolation. So one experiences moments of consolation, closeness to Jesus and certitude about one's purpose and happiness and bliss, alternating with moments of desolation where one has the experience of being far apart from Jesus. So let's see what that looks like for the 12. Their call is a moment of consolation. Jesus is on the scene, ready to stir things up. He calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John from their fishing boats. He calls the tax collector, Levi, in chapter 3, away from his tax collecting booth. They've been chosen to help Jesus carry out his ministry. Now, in spite of uh, the excitement of this, they wind up having their doubts when things get rough. When in chapter four, they're on the sea and the storm comes in, they have an experience of feeling abandoned by Jesus. They're fishermen. They know how bad storms can get and they're convinced they're going to die. And Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. That's a moment of desolation. Now they don't, handle that moment particularly well, right? They handle it by uh, angrily accusing Jesus of not caring whether they live or die. Jesus then stills the storm when he wakes up, but then also uh, points out their lack of faith in him. So that's a moment of desolation. Now, chapter 6, verse 13 is a very powerful moment of consolation. Why? Because at that point, Jesus commissions them to go out two by two to the villages of Galilee, carrying out his ministry. Repentance of sins, forgiveness of sins, casting out of demons, healing the sick. Jesus gives them the gift of his own power to do these things, and it works. They, too, are able to employ the gifts that Jesus has delegated to them in that ministry. And in that way, they become even more convinced of their importance to his mission and their closeness to God. Tremendous consolation. But they still don't understand things very well. In particular, chapter 8, verse 21 is an example of this, where Jesus is cautioning them about the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees. And they don't really understand what he's trying to say, and he points it out pretty explicitly. Do you not yet understand? He doesn't spell it out for them, but he calls them out for their cluelessness. In this case, their cluelessness about the importance of the ministry to both the Jewish people and the Gentiles together in the kingdom of God. 
So that's a moment of desolation. It's a moment of feeling apart from Jesus because they don't really understand what he's telling them. And that's in part because they have a certain obstinacy about their mission, an obstinacy that we're going to continue to see unfold. So in uh, chapter 8, verse 29, we have a moment of consolation for Peter as he correctly identifies Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus affirms that he's done so correctly, although tells him to keep it secret. But soon thereafter, Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. And then foretelling his death in particular, if he's foretelling his own death, what should his followers expect? And, and Peter immediately recognizes this, which is why he is so forceful in rebuking Jesus for making this prediction. And he, in turn, gets rebuked. Get behind me, Satan, as a consequence of saying that. That's a moment of desolation. This is followed by the transfiguration, which we've already discussed, a very powerful moment of consolation. But the transfiguration, in turn, is followed by a moment of desolation. Why? The disciples, commissioned back in chapter 6, verse 13, seem to have lost their power to cast out demons. It's deserted them. Now, why? Well, Jesus points out in chapter 9, verse 29, in answer to their question as to why they failed, this kind can only be driven out by prayer. And prayer is what they had not been doing. They had gotten a bit of full of themselves figured they were hot stuff, they could do this, and they had forgotten the importance of praying for those gifts that Jesus gave them on every occasion that they used them. So that's a moment of desolation. But then we have a moment of consolation in the discussion following the rich man coming to Jesus, where Jesus says there is Peter says first, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus replies, truly I say to you, there's no one who's left behind all these things who will not receive a hundredfold now and in the age to come eternal life. So Jesus here affirms, yes, I chose you, you followed me, and, and you will be rewarded in unfathomable ways. And Peter, James, and John in particular, having had a glimpse of eternal life, are very aware of the magnitude of what Jesus is offering here. A tremendous consolation. But more pointless squabbles follow, right? So, for instance, uh, chapter 10, verse 35, um, we have James and John asking to take the right and left hand of Jesus, and the other disciples get very angry with them about that. And Jesus has to explain to them that the true leader is a servant. And they weren't terribly ready to accept this. So again, it's a moment of desolation as they recognize that through their actions, they've put themselves out of Jesus' good graces. Now in chapter 11, they're feeling his good graces again as he accompanies them, as they accompany him on his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, greeted by hosannas and palms and all of that, we know this isn't going to last, of course. So we can see the cycle of consolation and desolation unfold in the interactions between the Twelve and Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. But this also applies to other uh, characters we meet in the Gospel. The Gerasene demoniac is another example of this. That encounter begins with a powerful consolation as Jesus casts out the legion of devils that possess him. He's then fully clothed in his right mind. And at that moment, he asks Jesus uh, if he can follow him, join his disciples. And Jesus says, no. Go out to the Decapolis and tell people, uh, of, of the good things you've experienced. So Jesus sends him away from his presence. That's a moment of desolation for the former demoniac. But this is followed up by a powerful consolation 
much later, uh, chapter 7, starting verse 31, up through chapter 8, verse 10. Why? Because, um, as we see at uh, in chapter 5, when he does go out to the Decapolis, people are amazed. They're impressed by what happened. And the initial impression of the Decapolis had been very negative towards Jesus. They asked him to go away after the demons killed the pigs. So already the situation had improved. And by the time Jesus returns to the Decapolis in chapter 7, verse 31, there is a great crowd ready for him. And the implication is it's because the former demoniac did as Jesus instructed him and spread the good news in the Decapolis. So Jesus then returning, greeted by a great crowd, is a tribute to his ministry and a tremendous consolation. Jairus experiences this cycle. His daughter is ill, a moment of desolation. Jesus says, Yes, I'll, I'll answer your entreaty. I'll come heal your daughter. Moment of consolation. But then his daughter dies. Major desolation. Uh, Jesus or People tell Jairus to send Jesus away. But Jesus doesn't give up on Jairus. And that small consolation then bears fruit through the resuscitation of his daughter, through Jesus raising her back from the dead into life. The story of Jairus frames the story of the woman with the hemorrhage. And framing is something we see a lot in the Gospel of Mark, where a story gets interrupted, another story comes in, and then the original story continues thereafter. We'll see this in a number of places. So she begins her story with a desolation. A hemorrhage had lasted 12 years, and nobody could do anything about it. She's effectively abandoned by physicians, by everyone she knows. Nobody can help her. And she had to suffer that desolation for a very long time. Why? I don't know. But Jesus saw it as necessary for his own reasons. And that's something we all have to accept about the desolations that we experience from time to time. They may last a long time, and God may permit that for his own purposes. So Jesus comes, and she goes up to touch his cloak, believing that if she touches it, she'll be healed. And that's exactly what happens. It's a moment of tremendous consolation because of what she had suffered from and what she had experienced. But then... Jesus seems angry about it and calls out, who touched me? And so she's called out of her anonymity, which is a moment of desolation, being singled out from the crowd. She doesn't know what he's going to do. But what he's going to do is adopt her into a spiritual family. Daughter, your faith has made you whole, is what Jesus says. Tremendous consolation. Final example that we'll look at here is one that doesn't end as well as some of our other examples. And this is the rich man. So first, his following of the commandments is affirmed. Jesus asks him, have you followed the commandments? And he says, I have observed all of these from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. At that saying, his countenance fell and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. It's a moment of desolation. The first desolation is the thought of the loss of his possessions. And the second desolation is refusing the gift of love that Jesus offered him. Jesus was offering him the gift of being free of his possessions because that's what he needed spiritually. And he declined that gift. So if we look back over all of these, we can learn and understand a lot about consolations and desolations. With regard to consolations, these are temporary experiences of closeness to God. In all of the cases we looked at, at some point the consolation goes away. It achieves a purpose in the moment, and that purpose isn't simply to 
make us happy in some vague sense. Each consolation is a gift that the recipient is meant to pass on to others in some manner or some way. So, for instance, in the transfiguration, part of the gift that they're being called to pass on is to follow what Jesus tells them and to be a witness to following what Jesus tells them. If we look at the case of the Gerasene demoniac, part of the gift is to announce that the good news has now come to the Decapolis. The Jewish Messiah has come to the Gentiles to be their Messiah too. So whenever we think about consolations, which are a great gift from God, we have to think about what is God calling us to do in response to this. Now, desolation is tough. And the desolations we examined here were tough. The woman enduring the hemorrhage, that was tough. The rich man being asked to give up his riches was tough. Now, desolations may or may not be a consequence of sin. There was nothing Jairus's Jairus or his daughter did to warrant her suffering. There's nothing that the woman did to warrant her 12 years of suffering. But sometimes they are a consequence of sin. In particular, some of the examples we saw with the disciples clamoring for position and so forth. The desolation is, in fact, Jesus withdrawing because of sin. But desolations themselves can produce fruit if we recognize that even if God doesn't directly want us to suffer, he does want us to bring holiness out of that suffering. So, for instance, the Gerasen demoniac brought holiness. He brought Jesus to people by, G by Jesus leaving him behind. That created an opportunity for him to bring Jesus to people because, after all, they had asked him to leave the district. The um, desolations that result from sin are an opportunity to recognize my sin has sent Jesus away. I need to repent of it so that he may return. And both consolations and desolations anticipate ultimate things. In a sense, the ultimate desolation, death, precedes the ultimate consolation, which will be eternal life, which Jesus speaks of at length in this section, right? He speaks of eternal life in uh, chapter 9, um, talk in the Gehenna Discourse, which we'll talk about in a moment, in chapter 10, where the rich man is asking, what do I need for eternal life? And Jesus gives him an answer affirming that eternal life is there to be had. And he affirms that again in response to what Peter says later in chapter 10. And in chapter 12, when the Sadducees deny eternal life, Jesus affirms it uh, in the face of their obstinacy. However, part of what Jesus teaches as well is that we have to confront our own death, our own mortality prior to that experience of eternal life. So when he predicts his death and resurrection three times, implicit in that is that the 12 as his followers will have to follow the same path. Take up your cross and follow me. And they're not terribly interested in that. And so they try to avoid the desolation that will precede that ultimate consolation. They do everything they can to avoid that prediction, whether it be Peter rebuking Jesus for it, whether it be the 12 squabbling about who is the greatest, or whether it's James and John seeking to occupy the chairs at his left and right hand. In all cases, they try to avoid what will follow. Now, in that third instance, Jesus emphasizes that he's come to give his life as a ransom for many. For them to have eternal life, we have to recognize that we are laboring under the dominance of the devil. 
the exorcisms that Jesus conducts, both in a real way, in a symbolic way, emphasize that that dominance of the devil has come to an end. However, it comes at a cost to Jesus. He is giving his life as a ransom for many. This idea is explained very well by C.S. Lewis in his classic book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The lion, Aslan, gives up his life as a ransom for the life of Edmund. But the one who takes his life cannot take it from him forever. Aslan returns. So likewise, Jesus will be crucified. And those who seek to crucify him, of course, are operating under the influence of the devil. But the devil cannot win. The devil cannot take Jesus' life irrevocably, and he will return. He will be resurrected. And that is something that the Twelve aren't quite ready to accept at this point. Now, eternal life is not automatic. Our sin can be an obstacle to it. And we saw that in the discussion of the unforgivable sin back in chapter 3. The point being there that those who claim that Jesus is performing his exorcisms in league with the devil are making the claim that Jesus' call to forgiveness and repentance is an empty call. And so dismissing the forgiveness that Jesus comes to bring is the unforgivable sin. It's to refuse this forgiveness that Jesus brings. Now in chapter 9, in his uh, discourse on Gehenna, Jesus gives us a little more detail about this. It'd be better to be cast into the sea with a millstone than to lead another into sin. And then he talks about how if any of your body parts cause you to sin, chop it off because it's better uh, to enter life maimed than to enter the unquenchable fire with that attachment. And really, this is something that is a metaphor. Jesus isn't speaking literally here. He's using figurative language to talk about the importance of eliminating whatever attachments to sin we happen to have. Now, in our Catholic faith, we have a very powerful tool for eliminating those attachments, namely the confessional. Whatever it is in your life that you need to amputate for the sake of your salvation, you can always bring to the confessional and thus be released of it and thus be ever more ready for the gift of eternal life that Jesus has come to bring. In the episode with the fig tree, we see an image of the person who may be refusing eternal life. So Jesus curses the fig tree in chapter 11 because he found nothing on it but leaves, it was not the time for figs. Now, the person who refuses to forgive can be seen as being like the fig tree that's not in season. So let, let's look at the lesson from the withered tree. Peter uh, remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus goes on to talk about how if you want anything, just ask for it, pray for it, and you'll get it. But then he says, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So one who refuses to forgive is like the fig tree not bearing fruit and is ultimately in danger of winding up like that fig tree withered without life but there's good news here jesus shows the way out forgive let go of whatever you need to let go of forgiveness does not necessarily entail um uh, 
reconciliation with a person, although it can. It most fundamentally entails, though, wishing the good for the forgiven person. Wishing, indeed, that they, too, may have eternal life. So one one powerful example of this that that I've witnessed in my own life is this. My my father is from Havana, Cuba. And he left under not good circumstances, which included um, some significant uh, stealing of property, really everything they had, and even the execution of uh, a great uncle of his. And for 53 years, he did not return. But ultimately, he did. And I had the opportunity to be with him on that return in 2013. Ten years ago, as I'm speaking now. And for him, that trip was about forgiveness and reconciliation. Letting go of the hatreds that he had allowed to build up in his heart so that he could forgive and move on. And in that forgiveness, he found within himself a new commitment of service to the poor of the island. And to this day, he returns there two to three times a year to do good works for the poor in Cuba. And in that process, and he's very upfront about this with people, to be a minister of reconciliation and healing in light of the trauma that Cuban people had experienced over the decades. So whatever we have in our hearts, whatever anger we have in our hearts, Jesus calls us to forgive it. And the essence of forgiveness is wishing them well, and indeed wishing that they too may inherit eternal life. So I've got a couple of questions for reflection for you to contemplate. Uh, First, in your own spiritual journey, what have been some key moments of consolation? And what gifts did God want you to hand on to others as a result of those consolations? And consider as well, what have been some key moments of desolation? What aspects of those desolations may have ultimately brought you closer to God? 